the draft reports from the England Peaceful Manifesto. Um, he's going to be talking to us about deep learning processing techniques. Maybe. Is that better? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, different sort of cluster techniques and how we can apply some uh, advanced methods to perhaps increase the classification capabilities uh, of these algorithms. So to start with then, what's the rationale behind uh, this research? Single particle detection uh, techniques often require grouping into distinct particle types, whether that be uh, fungus, bacteria, pollens, etc. cetera. Uh, and of course, as technology is increasing, the amount of data that we're gathering is also exponentially increasing as well. And that poses a little bit of a problem for us, which we'll come to in a moment. Common clustering techniques then that we see a lot is uh, algorithmative, so your um, hierarchical clas uh, clustering, or k-means, for example. And touching back on the, uh, the issues with larger amounts of data, we start coming into sort of data bottlenecks where uh, looking at the right hand side, for example, you've got techniques such as fast cluster, which the time taken to cluster is significantly larger than other techniques such as k-means. And you can also see that on the on the bottom here, if you, if you look at the overnight uh, if you look at the overnight figures here, you can see that the amount of um, data that you can, or particles that you can uh, go through with uh, k-means overnight is a more order of magnitudes larger than something like agglomerative. Uh, we also have to think about the suitability of pre-processing steps. So for example, you know, if uh, you were to apply agglomerative clustering to um, some binned data, concentration data over a large period of time, uh, and that took several days to, to compute. And then you realize, well, actually, binning it at that time frame is not giving me enough. I need to reduce uh, those bins to increase the, the uh, uh, data that I have because it might be missing some. Well, then you have to do that entire step again. And before you know it, after several iterations, you know, you may be uh, several days or weeks in. <laughs> So it is another problem there with that bottleneck. And then the final then, the final sort of challenge then is the incorporation of small lab data. So, you know, supervised learning techniques, this, that could be where you, uh, you you take a known sample and run it through your instrument. And then that becomes uh, a, a category or a label then that you'll want to use against larger ambient data sets where you don't know what you're looking at as such. So, the project that I'm looking at at the moment is trying to understand these challenges and see how we can perhaps improve them and uh, go forward with that. So where we've done that or where I've taken the data in this case is at our first super site in Manchester. And this has been part of a, a larger project called the Oscar project, which uh, has the goal of monitoring long-term air pollution and you know having a look at the effects of weather and other uh, variables and on the right here are just some interesting bits that uh, are recorded in real time uh, at the oscar site or at the super site and um, if they're of any interest to you then i'd encourage you to have a look at those but we took our data over a period of two months spanning june and july last year so we have quite a comprehensive large data set to have a look at before I get into how we've manipulated that data and how we've looked at it, I just want to tell you what the metrics are that we're looking at. So this is the WIBS NEO, Wideband Integrated Bioaerosol Sensor. And the measured parameters are single particle fluorescence with uh, particle size range covered from 0.5 to 30 microns. And then the particle asymmetry factor, which is a measure of its asphoricity uh, taken from a quadrant detector here and uh, calculated using mu theory. And it excites over two wave bands from 280 to 370 nanometers and emissions of 310 to 400 and 420 to 650. And they largely correspond to various amino acids such as tryptophan or riboflavin. And um, they are what fluoresce and give us our fluorescence uh, signature. 
Okay, so as I mentioned, our traditional techniques are agglomerative or k-means, but uh, what if we were to have a look at some deep learning techniques? So on the right here, we've got a general autoencoder, and how that works is uh, it, uh, it sort of cleans up the data, if you like. It compresses that data down into a latent space where you've got only uh, the, the required data that you need without any of this extra stuff that uh, is adding time onto your pre-processing pre or your, uh, your uh, uh, clustering. And it's that latent vector then that we use for either semi-supervised learning, which is, as I mentioned before, with uh, known samples, or what we're gonna be talking about more today, unsupervised learning, where you try and get it to teach itself and uh, produce a, a good classification. So the deep learning approaches then that we've looked at so far, are using an autoencoder to squash this data down and then applying agglomerative clustering to it, your sort of traditional method, and also k-means as well. We've also looked at deep embedded clustering, which I won't touch upon much today. And then finally, adversarial autoencoders, which take it to that next level of uh, complexity, but have some interesting uh, outcomes. And ultimately what we're trying to get from this then is to solve the computational bottleneck uh, and, and perhaps the suitability of pre-processing. Okay, so if we uh, jump a little bit more into the rabbit hole briefly, uh, laser representation, i.e. the middle here, is not always expressed by parametric distribution. And um, you can sample from the latent space to generate new data. Uh, so that would be sort of your, your normal distribution here. But what if we wanted to have a look at different distributions? And that's especially relevant for large ambient data sets. Well, that's uh, where an adversarial autoencoder sort of comes in. So the general sort of theory behind this is that uh, it generates a categorical vector for each individual particle. Um, and that is to say that uh, it has a, it generates an array. And depending on the positions of the, the zeros and ones, then it will categorize each particle before uh, coming to a cluster label at the end. And of course, that's assumed to carry information about the input data, uh, which is the same, uh, same as the uh, um, encoding categories. The second part of this then is to train the discriminators to recognize real and fake latent distribution and categorical vectors. So how we do that is we have a, a generator um, and that provides fake data points to the discriminator alongside the real data. And then the discriminator's job then is to uh, well, discriminate between the real and fake. And uh, it's a bit of an iterative process. They, they, they train each other. So it, uh, it heavily penalizes the uh, generator if it gets it wrong and so, and so, and so, so on and so forth. And it repeats this cycle until uh, we reach a number of clusters that is uh, suitable or, or uh, optimal. Okay, so, so looking at what we've actually done so far then and what we've seen, uh, latent k-means actually gave us results that were very similar to traditional agglomerative clustering. That in itself was quite significant, we found, because, of course, the, the time to solution there was significantly decreased when you're looking at uh, a method that uh, is, is far quicker, such as k-means. However, one thing we did see was increased separation from the autoencoder approach. So we saw clear diurnal patterns in some of the data, which are not uh, visible here. And we interpret those as potentially spores or in interference. And um, it kind of highlights a problem with the optimum cluster metrics. So of course, with uh, k-means or agglomerative clustering, you have to define your number of clusters. But with adversarial autoencoding, you don't. It will determine the optimal number of clusters on its own. So uh, we have an example of an agglomerative here and that's defined, it's defined uh, with six clusters. Um, and then we have a adversarial output that has defined with seven clusters. And we can see similarities between these. For example, uh, the, we have a box plot here, which is, is very similar here, but where there's also a large amount of differences between uh, what we're seeing in both of these as well. So it identifies a number of sort of unusual behaviors. And um, our job now really is to try and interpret what 
is going on here and what we're looking at and whether it is uh, better than these uh, traditional methods like k-means and adversarial autoencoding, uh, sorry, and, and dormancy clustering. So to summarize it here then, you know, what we have is uh, the, the bottleneck is, is uh, lower at these stages with a higher degree of automation. But as we sort of make our way to the right, then we're increasing that complexity uh, by but decreasing the bottleneck. So, so you're having a faster time to solution speed, uh, but uh, a higher complexity. So it's a bit of a trade off. Uh, however, potentially worth it with more information and faster time to solutions. So to summarize then, compute bottlenecks mitigated for large data set. However, it should, it should be said, it doesn't negate the need to profile other methods either. And the caveat of course is increased diversity in outputs, which still needs expert interpretation. Automation is achievable, which is something that we haven't come to yet as a future work prospect. Uh, though it's still important to count for uh, you know, uh, regularization and, uh, and joint loss balance. And uh, of course, application to larger data sets is ongoing and offers us the potential for predictive capability in time series analytics. And on that note then, uh, any community collaborations are welcome. You're uh, able to speak to myself, uh, Professor David Topping or Martin Gallagher today, and we would uh, be, we'd welcome any collaborations at all on that. Finally then, acknowledgements. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the aforementioned David Topping and uh, Martin Gallagher, my supervisors. I would like to thank Droplet Measurement Technologies for their sponsorship and continued support. And in addition, I'd like to thank Manchester University team, Aerosol CDT team and the EPSRC. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I can see that so we have some messages in the chat room that there are any of them questions that people would like to ask. Okay, right. Do you have any questions? I have uh, thanks to the whole thing in Dormitory. I am not sure whether you explained it or, or not, but if you did, I might have missed it. Yep. I wanted to know what you actually mean by the bottleneck and where it kind of comes from. Sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, the, the bottleneck is when I when we say bottleneck, we, we, we refer to it in terms of time. So that the bottleneck is is uh do, do, do. here here it describes the bottleneck quite well, I think. So you can see that the time taken to cluster for uh other methods such as that it's sort of blocked a little bit though, the key is blocked, but fast cluster and um uh SK learn, other methods like that take a significantly longer amount of time to form a cluster than perhaps some of these uh, other methods like k-means, these simpler methods, which traditionally have been thought of as quite basic, but when you apply those to a latent space um, by autoencoding, we're actually seeing that it produces results that are similar to a more advanced method like agglomerative clustering, but uh, with, a, with a lower time frame to solution. So the bottleneck to answer the question is in this time to cluster. To, to, to formulate your solution. Any other questions for Great. Okay. I think you are already said the math. So thank you very much for your time.